Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. Recently I announced my upcoming Steam game, Dinky Guardians. It's a fun solo or co-op game with some automation-based building and some defense mechanics. Go ahead and add it to your wishlist, there's a link in the description. In the announcements video I talked about the game and what are my hopes and goals for this project. I tried to be as transparent as possible so you can see exactly how I plan my own professional projects. There were a bunch of interesting questions in the comments which I think are also helpful for indie devs watching this channel. Questions on where to get funding, am I using AI, what assets am I using, time management, marketing, logo, pricing, and a bunch more. So here, let me answer a bunch of those. First off, here is an interesting comment. Here, Parkanap asks, how much time a week do you plan to spend? It's actually kind of funny how I used to be a full-time game dev, making games was my only occupation. Then over the past five years, I devoted more and more time to this channel, making videos, tutorials, and courses to the point where it's been three years since my last Steam game, so I did kind of the opposite of most people, where you start doing it on the side before transitioning into full time. So for this project, like I mentioned in the announcement video, my challenge is making this game alongside making videos on the channel. In terms of time management, my current plan is roughly one week working on game dev and one week working on videos. Which honestly, I think this is actually a good thing that makes this game journey a bit more relatable to most viewers. I assume most of you are hobbyist indie game devs, meaning people who are doing game dev on the side and not full time, so me building this game one week on and one week off is kind of similar to having a regular job and doing game dev on the weekends. I hope that by watching me build this game slowly week by week will be inspiring to those of you doing game dev on the side. Next here, Yolokaz has an interesting question with regards to funding. So are you applying for any government or state funds for your company? This is an interesting option that a lot of indie devs don't know about. Several countries have this kind of funding for art related projects and video games usually can apply. The good news is you might get some funding. The bad news is usually this involves a ton of bureaucracy. I saw a great video on this topic a few months ago. This video showcased the process and how for them it really turned out to be quite a nightmare. So going for government funding is definitely tricky, but it's good to know at least that that option exists. Now, in my case here in Portugal, I doubt that such a thing exists, but even if it does, thankfully I don't need it. One of the things that I mentioned in my Game Dev Journey video is how one of the things that helped me the most in becoming a professional indie dev is simply the fact that I'm living in a low cost of living country. Over here in Portugal, I can live pretty cheaply. When I first moved out of my parents' house, I was living on my own for about 750 euros per month. That includes rent, food, and utilities. My first Steam game, Survivor Squad, took about one year to develop, which means in order to turn a profit, I really just had to make about eight grand. Thankfully it made more than that on the first month alone, so basically because of that, and because I generally don't really spend money on many things, because of that I've always had savings so I've always self-funded my own games. My story would definitely be quite a lot different if instead I lived in San Francisco and I required 10k a month just to get by, and nowadays with this channel, with all my over 700 videos and courses, this is now profitable. I was burning through my savings for the first 3 years of this channel, but thankfully nowadays this is profitable. So because of all of that, thankfully I have no need for external funding. But in case you do, definitely go ahead and do some research if your government has some grants that might help you fund your games. Then here's a funny comment talking about how ChatGPT makes me really productive. I don't know if this was intended as a joke or not, but I actually did generally use ChatGPT to help me. Now like I covered in my ChatGPT video, I did not use it for generating code. I don't think that's a good use case for that tool. But I did use it to come up with the name of the game. I asked it to give me 20 cute sounding words for creatures and gave me a whole bunch of them. Then I'll look at the list and that's how I came up with the name Dinky Guardians. So yep, I would definitely encourage you to see how you can use some AI in your game dev process. Personally, I would not use it for generating code, but I do find it very useful for some general brainstorming. Then over here, AJ is asking about the art style of the game and what is the technical term for it. And yep, this is indeed cell shading, and specifically I am using the equivalent shader which I picked up from the S store. It has tons of options and looks perfect for the cartoony look that I'm really going for. This is also how I'm handling the selection of the objects. So as the player approaches an object, the outline simply switches from black to white, and that is simply just change the outline color on the shader itself. Next over here we have Sumant asking pretty much how do you manage time. I must say this is a pretty tricky one. This is a topic that I'm always struggling with, so I'm not sure I'm the right person to give advice on this. In terms of general tips, I would say consistency is more important than doing some sprints. So try doing just a tiny amount of game dev every single day, rather than try to work non-stop for a few days straight. Remember that this is a lifelong journey, so take your time and just focus on learning. For some more practical tips, I covered some of them in my work from home video. What I covered there is pretty much still exactly what I do nowadays. My two best tips are take breaks from work and work from a list. Those two things really help me stay on track. Next here we have a nice question, so are you going to upload a tutorial on this game? 
One thing that people might not know about is the difference in the amount of work between me making something just by myself or making it as a step-by-step -step course or tutorial. Basically for this game, what you see in the announcement trailer was all built in roughly about two weeks. However, if I were to build all those systems as part of a step-by-step -step course, it would have instead taken me probably something like four months. It really is a huge difference, it's a completely different scale, so it really is pretty much impossible for me to make such a tutorial whilst also working on the game. However, over the course of development, I do plan to do some tutorials, or at least some deep dives on how some of these systems work, so stay tuned for that. And of course, remember that game dev systems are very interchangeable, meaning you don't need to see how I implemented, for example, the interaction system in this specific game, you can go watch how I handle interactions in my free course. The way that I'm doing it in this game is pretty much exactly the same. It does a physics query to find the object in front and simply calls a function on an interface. For the tower shooting the enemies, it uses the same fine target logic that I also covered. Then the dinkies are driven by a super basic state machine. So many of the things that I'm using in this game I've already covered in separate videos on this channel. Next here is an interesting comment, NC basically saying that they had a similar idea to mine. This is actually a very important topic, it only saddens me to see comments from someone saying they had some idea but then they gave up because some other game made something similar. The truth is that game development is extremely complex. If two people have literally the exact same thought, and even if they both start from the exact same design document, if they both execute that idea, I guarantee the final two games will be completely different. Building a complete game involves thousands or millions of tiny decisions and all of those add up to make up the final game. So even if you start from the exact same starting point, they will diverge very quickly. So if you have some idea for a cool game and you see someone else working on a similar idea, don't let that stop you. If you really want to turn that idea into reality, then go for it. The end result will be very different. Next here is an extremely important comment. Antikai asks, what is the hook for Dinky Guardians? This is extremely important. Like I've mentioned previously, nowadays if you want to find success, you absolutely need to think about marketing from day one. So my hook for Dinky Guardians is this is a fun co-op action game mixed with some automation elements and some base building. Honestly, I would say that is not the absolute best hook. It is not something that sends out right away, but that is why I made sure to include all those mechanics right in the beginning of the trailer. That way it shows right away that it's not just yet another co-op game with nothing else different. Also, I should say that the strength of your hook is directly proportional to the length of development. The goal for this game is to build it in about 4 months, and for such a short dev cycle, I'm okay with a less than stellar hook. But if I were planning on working on this game for the next 3 years, then I would definitely want a much more impactful hook. Either way, the advice to you is definitely identify your game hook, identify why someone would play your game and not something else. In my case, the answer is basically if someone enjoyed playing Overcooked and they want something similar to play with friends, and they also enjoyed Factorio, then I think they will enjoy this game. Then here is a nice practical question from Lee, so how do you make your own game logos? The answer is that I used to do them myself, which was always really difficult, I'm really not an artist, but nowadays I go on Fiverr and I find an artist. That's how I got this Dinky Guardians logo, also the one for Total War Liberation and Kitchen Chaos. For all of those, I contracted an artist and I'm really happy with the results. I think the cost was only about 70 bucks for each of them, which is definitely very reasonable and definitely much better than anything I could have drawn by myself. Again, going back to marketing, your Steam capsule is extremely important, so do make sure you have a good looking logo. Then here is a nice comment from Maximka talking about wishlisting the game as a thank you. Let me take this time that yep you should definitely do this, not just for my game but for any dev you follow. Wishlists matter a ton, so if there's a dev you like or a game that looks interesting, definitely go ahead and add it to your wishlist. It might not seem like much but it generally does help. This is something that I also covered in the marketing video. Wishlists have a very strong correlation with sales numbers, so if you want to help some developer, go ahead and wishlist their game. And right now, let me ask you to wishlist Dinky Gardens if you haven't already. And my advice to you is if you're working on a game, then go ahead and ask people to wishlist it. Then also a second question on what models am I using. For this, I personally suck at 3D modeling. I've learned the basics from following a course quite a while ago, but I still can only do some extremely basic stuff. So for visuals, yep, I am absolutely using assets. I won't cover which ones I'm using in a future video. And for those of you who are worried about using assets in your game, I would point you to my video covering that question, which is should you use assets or are people going to call your game an asset flip? I did some research and the basic answer is nope, it does not matter. All that players care about is that the game is good and fun to play, so use whatever assets you can find to bring your vision to life. Then here's a good one. 
In the video I say that you should never price your games under $10, but here as the vid points out, why do I say that if all of my games are under $10? And the answer is actually very simple, it's because I only learned that after launching all of those games. So that, and also the fact that the market changes. Basically nowadays it's really difficult to reach people, and if you price your game at $5 versus $10, then you really need to reach double the number of people to get the same revenue and that is really difficult. Also nowadays there are tons of awesome games, so the idea of pricing your game low so as to encourage some impulse purchases, that really doesn't work very well nowadays. There's also the issue with sales, a lot of players only buy games on discount and they only pay attention to the discount percentage and not the actual value, so a ton of players will really only buy your game at 50% off, regardless if it's 50% of $10 or $5. So in general, based on a lot of research from people much smarter than me in that area, the general consensus is you should not charge under $10. Although at the same time, that's just general advice. If you're working on your very first game and you have no experience, then I would probably encourage you to focus on gaining experience with that project rather than focus on making money. And specifically on pricing, here's another comment. Makoto points out how for a multiplayer game, it can be helpful to price higher, but also include an extra copy. And yep, this is definitely what I'm thinking about. Although I do believe these kind of special pricing packages, these ones need to be manually done by Valve, so I'm not entirely sure if they do this for any developer, but yep, this is definitely something that I'm planning to pursue, just not sure if it's possible. Then Craft Messi asks, what about split screen co-op? And this is something that I hope to do, but I'm not entirely sure. Making it only in local co-op shouldn't be too difficult, but making it work with players that are online and some that are local, making it mixed, now that is quite a bit tricky. So ideally, yes, but not entirely sure if it's possible. Alright, so those are my answers to those questions. Hopefully it's somewhat helpful for you to hear how I think about all of these topics. Go ahead and add Dinky Gardens to your wishlist. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.